Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Eric Franzen. I'm with Dataversity, and we would like to thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar, a production of Dataversity in the Smart Data webinar series. Our speaker today is Subhatai Ahmad of Numenta. Today, Subhatai will be discussing applying neocortical research to streaming analytics. Just a few quick points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that we expect during these sessions, uh, attendees are muted during our webinars. We will be collecting questions, however, in the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. At some points during today's presentation, the layout of your screen may change. This is due to the type of media the presenter needs to show. Uh, sometimes this happens, usually not, but if it does, please be aware that a drop-down navigation panel will appear at the top center of your screen, and you will still be able to access the Q&A and other modules using that panel. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information that may come up during the webinar. This webinar today is part of a series held on the second Thursday of each month. We're glad you've joined us today, and we look forward to seeing you in subsequent months. I know a few words about our speaker. Subhatai Ahmad is the VP of Research at Numenta, a company focused on machine intelligence. Numenta's technology, Hierarchical Temporal Memory, or HTM, is a detailed computational framework based on principles of the brain. Subhatai's experience includes computational neuroscience, machine learning, computer vision, and building real-time commercial systems. He has previously served as VP Engineering at Yes Video, where he helped grow the company from a three-person startup to a leader in automated digital media authoring. In 1997, Subhatai co-founded ePlanet Interactive, a spin-off from Interval Research. ePlanet developed the Intel Play Me Too Cam, the first computer vision product developed for consumers. Subhatai holds a BS in computer science from Cornell and a PhD in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please welcome Subhatai Ahmad. Subhatai. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm really happy to be here and talk to you about some of the latest stuff that we're doing. Um, let me switch over to my slides. Okay, so hopefully, um, you, yeah, so hopefully you guys can see my title slide there. Um, can. Okay, great. Um, so as some of you know, and as uh, Eric kind of mentioned, uh, at Numenta, we've been developing uh, machine intelligence algorithms that are inspired by neuroscience and uh, a pretty deep understanding of how the brain works. Uh, we've been doing this for about 10 years, um, and we've worked with uh, dozens of customers over the years, primarily uh, in the area of streaming analytics and the Internet of Things. Um, in this process, we've learned quite a bit about the industry in general and streaming analytics and streaming applications in, in particular. Um, so it's become sort of clear to us that these two worlds, the world of neuroscience and the world of analytics, are about to converge in a particular way. Um, so today what I want to do is kind of share with you what I mean by that. It may not be immediately obvious um, where we are kind of in that process and where we're going. So I'd like to start with a, a customer story. Hopefully you can see this next slide. Um, so this is a case study from one of those customers that we, we spoke, uh, that I mentioned. And this particular customer is a pretty technically sophisticated customer and a major online retailer. And they do something pretty neat. Um, what they do is every day they uh, produce a forecast of their entire company's revenue, and they do this on a daily basis. Um, and the way they do that is as follows. Every night at 10 o'clock, um, they ship all, all the different departments, ship their data um, to a team of 10 analysts that's working kind of on the other side of the world. Um, and this team um, works overnight, our time, 
Um, they gather data from, you know, they look at all the data that's been sent to them, but they also put together data from uh, the financial markets, uh, weather reports, uh, maybe sports, major sports events that might be going on and so on, and they put all of this together into a model. And then at 5 a.m. our time, they send an email to the CEO and all the C-level execs that says, okay, today's forecast is, you know, uh, let's say 63 million. And then at the end of the day, they repeat this process. Um, this is pretty sophisticated. Most customers, most companies don't even do this today. Um, and this uh, forecast that they produce is very accurate. Um, and they put a lot of time and effort into producing this number, and it's really helpful to them uh, in running their business. Um, but they wanted to take this one step further. So what they wanted to do with the next generation is instead of generating one number per day, they wanted to generate predictions every 15 minutes. Um, and instead of doing a single global revenue prediction, they wanted to track all of their product categories. Um, and they wanted to track it in all of their important geographies because there are important kind of local effects that happened that they wanted to capitalize on. And this basically uh, would allow them, if they could do this, to react rapidly to changes that are going on in their business and, you know, regardless of which department it is in and where in the world it is. But this required them to go from one prediction every day to hundreds of thousands of predictions a day. And they were completely uh, at a loss as to how to, how to about, go about doing this. And there are basically two different problems here. One is that their data infrastructure was really cumbersome. Uh, the way they gathered the data and the kind of the, uh, um, you know, the way they're gathering external sources of data and so on was a fairly manual uh, process, um, and this is not going to scale. And then what they really wanted to talk to us about is that the algorithm approach was completely unclear. Right now they have 10 analysts working all day long to generate a single number, um, and this just is not going to scale to the kind of predictions they wanted to do. Um, and it's pretty amazing how many companies I've spoken with that have the same basic story. Um, this is not just in finance. It, this kind of shift is happening in advertising where you might want to analyze click-through rates and the uh, weightings of different uh, you know, um, advertising categories uh, and predictive maintenance where you want to uh, man, you know, maintain and monitor uh, large machines, expensive machines, uh, environmental monitoring, energy prediction, and so on and so on. And it's become clear to us that there's a pretty large shift happening in the industry from kind of this one slow prediction to lots and lots and lots of very fast predictions uh, in a streaming uh, manner. Now, you could ask, well, why can't you just take the existing way of doing it, throw more hardware at it? Let's say you figure out the data infrastructure um, and you just throw a lot of hardware at it and just um, you know, generate uh, more predictions faster. Well, it turns out it's not as simple as that. And the basic process that machine learning um, departments use today is it just will not scale to that. So in this next slide, um, this is a typical slide that you might see in a, in a workshop or in a class as to how machine learning is done. And this is very typical of what happens uh, today. There's a step where you get the data, gather the data, you prepare it. Uh, you have to choose the algorithm properly depending on the, the type of forecast you want to do and the type of data. Uh, you often have to be very careful as to how you create your inputs to that uh, system. You have to be careful about the exact training methodology you use. Depending on the algorithm and depending on the data, you may want to use different types of uh, training uh, methodologies. And then there's a fairly complicated, almost a black art of testing and validating your model, making sure that it's really working well on your data. Um, and then if everything goes well, you'll deploy it, and uh, hopefully by then, uh, you know, the system will still be applicable. Um, but more likely than not, you have to then repeat the process, uh, go through the whole thing again because now the system, the statistics have been changing. And this cycle uh, sometimes takes um, weeks to months to do. And the, the previous company had, narrow, you know, uh, optimized it to doing it, they were able to do it once a day, but they could only generate one, one number. And what's really going on is that basically the future of data is moving towards streaming data. Instead of doing a small number of slow predictions where the amount of data that we're collecting is exploding, uh, the number of sources of data is really expanding, and the frequency at which that data is coming is also increasing. And what, what there's a need for is to, instead of manually creating models, is to automatically create models. 
um, instead of manually tweaking and readjusting parameters, you want systems that can continuously learn, that can automatically adjust to the changes in the statistics. And all of these data streams are inherently temporal in nature, so you need techniques and algorithms that can deal with temporal data streams and sequences. And at the end of the day, you want to get back predictions or anomalies if something unusual is going on, um, recommendations for different actions. And as I mentioned before, um, there are two different components to this. One of this is that the data infrastructure that's in most, available in most companies today is extremely batch focused and you need a streaming uh, data infrastructure. And equally important, you need a very different algorithm approach. The previous very batch way of creating algorithms just will not scale to this new world where streaming data is the norm, not the exception. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the streaming data infrastructure as such. There's a lot of good work going on in terms of NoSQL databases, Storm and Spark and, and so on. Um, I'm going to focus on the algorithm approaches because that's where there's been less attention paid to that. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and I'm going to discuss kind of our neuroscience-based approach and how we think that will solve these problems. Uh, let me first provide a little bit of background about Numenta, since we are a little bit of an unusual company and I don't know how many of you have, uh, uh, have heard of us. So we were uh, founded by Jeff Hawkins and Donna Dubinsky back in uh, 2005. Jeff and Donna are well known in the industry for having founded Palm Computing and Handspring. Jeff's actual interest all throughout has actually been in neuroscience and he tried to go to graduate school in neuroscience. And while running Palm, he also ran uh, the nonprofit Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. Um, and while he was running that, he published the book uh, on intelligence in 2004, which has had a pretty major impact on neuroscience and machine learning researchers. In 2005, he decided to form Numenta as a for-profit company, and the Redwood Center um, went over to Berkeley, where it's still there as part of the neuroscience department in UC Berkeley. And within Numenta, we've continue to work on the algorithms and, and our neuroscience theory, and there's been basically three different generations of our stuff. Um, back between 2005 and 2009, we worked on the first generation of our algorithms, which we call hierarchical temporal memory. Uh, we primarily worked on computer vision uh, systems back then, and we released uh, some applications in computer vision. Um, between 2009 and 2014, we worked on a a uh, very different generation, a second generation of our algorithms, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later. Um, and these algorithms are really focused on sequences and continuous learning. Um, we looked at a lot of different streaming data applications. Uh, we released our, our code as an open source project on GitHub. Um, and we focused initially a lot on anomaly detection. Um, more recently, since about last year, we've continued looking at streaming applications and we've started a brand new uh, um, you know, research direction on a third generation of algorithms that's going to look at sensory motor inference and the role of feedback. And I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to focus more on our uh, streaming applications. So why do we study neuroscience? Um, so in machine learning, there's actually a pretty rich history of incorporating big ideas from neuroscience. And it has led to many of the advances in the field. And over the last 10 years, there's actually been an explosion in the field of neuroscience in terms of the data that is available and the sophistication of the experiments that, that the scientists are running. And there's a tremendous amount we can learn from neuroscience about the specific nature of learning and intelligence uh, in general. And I'm going to discuss a couple of the properties that will help us address the challenges in streaming data that I mentioned earlier. So here's my one kind of brain slide that I'm going to walk through. Um, and within neuroscience, we primarily focus on the neocortex. Um, the cortex is the majority of your brain. It's about 75% by volume. Um, it's the center of most of your high-level thought and cognition. And what does it do? Well, at a very simplistic level, it's the best uh, streaming analytics system out there. Uh, it receives a continuous stream of sensory data from your eyes, your ears, your skin, et cetera. It's continuously building models of that data and then outputs a stream of actions in the form of sequences of muscle commands. Um, and we use the term hierarchical temporal memory to describe the class of algorithms that model um, properties of the, of the neocortex. And there are four specific properties I want to talk about uh, in this slide uh, that's relevant to streaming data. 
One is that if you look um, inside the brain, it's actually organized as a hierarchy of nearly identical regions. Um, so by hierarchy, we mean there's a, um, regions of the brain that accept direct input from sensory um, organs. Um, those regions then feed data into higher level regions, and they feed onto next higher level regions and so on. What's really interesting is that these regions, by, by and large, are computing almost exactly the same learning algorithm. You can actually take visual data and feed it to the auditory cortex, and it will learn visual features just fine. So, the, so there's actually a common learning algorithm that's um, uh, you know, appropriate to all the different sensory modalities. The second uh, important thing that, that neuroscientists have learned is that the representation that's used, just like there's a common algorithm, there's also a common data structure. And we call this sparse distributed representations. Uh, most of the neurons are silent. Only a few are on at, a, at any point in time, hence the term sparse. Uh, and the representations are distributed in the sense that no one neuron is critical to anything. You can, uh, you can have a number of neurons that fail and everything will still be fine. So the information is kind of distributed across a collection of neurons. Uh, the third important property is that all of these regions are mostly comprised of sequence memory. And this kind of makes sense. If you think about it, most of our sensory data are, is a sequence of information, and most of the inferences we're making are depend on sequences of uh, sequential information. Similarly, most of our output is in, the for, is in the form of a sequence of muscle commands, and so most of the synapses or the, the data that's stored in, in neurons is actually uh, has to do with sequential information, not static batch information. The fourth important property is that every region is constantly learning. There's never a point where the brain just stops learning and freezes for, for days or years. We are constantly learning. We can constantly learn new things. As things change, we adapt. Um, and this continuous learning is fully automated. And if you step back a little bit, these are exactly the properties that we need uh, in the new world of streaming analytics. Uh, so we have uh, implemented this stuff. Um, uh, we have implemented uh, a, a small slice of, of cortex. Uh, the implementation that we have currently is a very high-capacity memory-based system. It's extremely good at modeling high-order temporal sequences. Um, it makes predictions continuously and can uh, detect anomalies. It is a continuously learning system. Um, this algorithm has very few uh, sensitive parameters. What that means is that you don't really have to tweak or tune the system as you change domains. Most of the parameters apply to all of the domains. And the current implementation, which is a tiny part of Cortex, runs in real time on a laptop. Um, it, this system models about 65,000 cells and hundreds of thousands of connections between cells. So I'm not going to go into detail in the algorithm itself. Um, it's all described in a white paper, and the full source code is available on GitHub at the URL there. Instead, I'm going to describe how we apply the algorithm to various uh, streaming analytics applications. So we've released something called the HTM engine, which makes it extremely easy to instantiate and run a large number of HTM models. Um, each model is attached to a stream, such as a metric value that's changing over time. Uh, the data is then encoded into a sparse distributed representation, an SDR, which is a common data structure used in Cortex. The SDR is fed to our algorithms, and a stream of predictions, anomaly scores, and so on are published uh, in a database. And with the HTM engine, you can instantiate thousands of models on a single server. It's highly optimized, and it runs all these models in parallel. And we've actually applied this architecture to several different applications. So in this slide, I'm showing some of the applications that we work with. Uh, we worked on applying the algorithms to detecting um, anomalies in, in servers and data structures. We've uh, applied it to detecting you know, anomalies in human behavior. Uh, we've applied it to financial markets. We've applied it to social media, detecting anomalies in, in Twitter streams. And we've even applied it to GPS and, and geospatial tracking. So I'm going to go into uh, show some examples from a couple of these. So in this screen, um, I'm showing some screenshots of our uh, Grok application, which does automatic anomaly detection 
for uh, uh, those who have uh, their servers on AWS or Amazon Web Services. If you look at the chart on the left, um, in each of these charts, actually, the, the blue data, the blue graph shows the actual metric value, and the graph, the colored graph show our, the result of our anomaly detection. And uh, red means that an anomaly was detected, and green means everything is, is normal. So if you look at the chart on the left, it shows uh, CPU utilization in a, in a particular database, and you can see that there's a point in time where the CPU suddenly jumps up and then stays up. And uh, the system detects that as an anomaly. But then because there's a continuously learning system, because the CPU usage is staying up, it automatically ad adjusts to that new value and uh, after a while it's not an anomaly anymore. So there's no manual tweaking of thresholds or anything. That particular jump is an anomaly and then shortly after that, that becomes a new normal. If you look at the middle screen, uh, that shows um, data from a load balancer, and this is, uh, the blue value shows the latency of our load balancer on a, on a particular website. And this data is extremely unpredictable. Most of the time, the latencies are small, but every once in a while, the latency jumps up to, you know, two, three seconds or whatever, and that's just normal. But in the middle, you'll see that there was a period of time where the latencies were jumping up to that higher level much more, much more frequently than normal and the system was automatically able to detect that as an anomaly. So here's a system where it's an extremely unpredictable data stream. You can never predict the next latency you're going to get, but it automatically detected um, uh, you know, an anomaly in, in the frequency at which the latencies are uh, becoming slow. And here you can note that no threshold would have caught this. Um, you, the actual instantaneous value of the load balance or latency was not abnormal. It's the fact that the statistics of that changed over time. The third screen on the right shows you one of my favorite examples. This has actually happened on our system in our data center. And what happened is that uh, this shows the CPU utilization of one of our uh, uh, servers, and uh, there was a point in time where the Amazon API server actually broke down in the East Coast and stopped responding. And what happened is that Grok detected that anomaly an hour before it actually happened. Um, and how is this possible? Um, so what happened is that the, before the API server actually failed, it started to slow down. It started to take longer servicing these requests, and the CPU utilization in our server started bouncing up and down because it would be waiting for some API uh, request to come in, and then a whole bunch would come in at once. It would have to service it, and so it would sort of bounce up and down. Now, the actual instantaneous value of the CPU, let's say 55% or 66% or whatever, was not unusually high. There were definitely points in time where the CPU usage would jump up even to 100%. What was really unusual, though, was the way it was fluctuating. And this is an example of um, how our algorithms can detect temporal anomalies. The instantaneous value is not abnormal, but the actual behavior over time was extremely abnormal. And so because it was very sensitive to that. It was able to detect um, a breakdown in, or an upcoming breakdown in the API server actually an hour before anything showed up on, on the Amazon uh, status boards. So these three examples, so kind of the unique value of HTML algorithms, particularly with uh, streaming analytics. Um, all of these models are created automatically. Um, a user needs to know nothing about machine learning or HTML algorithms, you can configure hundreds of models in, in minutes. The systems are continuously learning. As soon as they're brought up, they're um, learning continuously and they automatically adapt to changes, as you can see on the left screen there. And it can detect very sophisticated uh, temporal anomalies. This next screen shows another um, application. It's the same idea, except we've changed the data streams. Instead of feeding it IT data or data from data centers, we're feeding it financial data. Um, what you see on the left is a screenshot from our mobile application, HTM for Stocks. It's actually available on the Google Play Store right now. If you have an Android phone, you can uh, download this and use it. And what this application does is it continuously monitors the top 200 stocks and the most anomalous stocks are showed at the top there. And the way we determine that is we're doing 
that we're monitoring three different metrics per stock. We're looking at the stock price and its fluctuations over time. We're looking at the trading volume, and we're also looking at the volume of Twitter chatter about that stock. And if more than one of these metrics is anomalous at any point in time, they show up right at the top as, as being anomalous as in both stock and Twitter feed. And then if it's just anomalous, uh, if it's just the stock um, activity is anomalous, then it sh uh, shows up uh, under a lower category there. So this system will automatically detect um, anomalies in stock, you know, the stock behavior as well as Twitter behavior. And you can see, as, as shown in the middle screenshot there, the Twitter chatter often detects some, something unusual, or you can detect something unusual from the Twitter chatter a little before it actually shows up in the, in the stock market. Uh, and if you click on that, you can actually look at the actual tweets that are causing that, um, those anomalies. Okay. So this is a very interesting application. Um, again, it's the exact same idea, same engine underlying it. Um, it's just that the metrics that we're feeding it are totally different. Um, we've actually applied it to uh, GPS data as well. Um, and what we've done is we've, uh, we can automatically detect anomalies in geospatial tracking data. Um, and we can feed the HTM engine a stream of GPS data as well as the velocity of, of um, any, any, any object. And you, you can imagine using this to track a fleet of, of, of trucks, uh, ships, airplanes. Uh, you can even uh, imagine tracking people that way. I actually want this for my kid so I can know if something unusual is happening. If he goes off somewhere that he shouldn't be going, I, I want to be notified of that. Now, the Cortex doesn't receive anything like GPS data. So how can we actually take GPS data and feed it to a cortical algorithm? Well, the basic trick is uh, that we figured out how to convert GPS coordinates into a sparse distributed representation. So this is a sparse high dimensional representation that has all of the properties that we expect uh, from SDRs. And then after the input is encoded as an SDR, the learning algorithm is completely agnostic to it. It's now in this common kind of data format and now the algorithm can just operate on it. Operate on it. it knows nothing about whether it's in uh, GPS data or stock data or anything else. So we actually built uh, a prototype system of this um, we gave this to our, one of our employees, and we had the system kind of, um, you know, continuously monitoring his GPS coordinates throughout, you know, over the course of several weeks. Um, and what this screen shows is his trace as he went, uh, as he commuted uh, daily. And now this is a continuously learning system. So the very first day it started using it, the system was learning his traces. Now in the beginning, everything is unusual because it has no prior behavior. So you can see that everything is read here in, in this trace. Um, on the second day, um, it starts to learn some of the patterns, but there's still enough variation there that there are still uh, points at which things are unusual. So you can see there's some, um, you know, some red there. There's you know, there's some yellow as well, which is somewhat anomalous. And this just had to do with variations in uh, traffic and so on. But by the third or fourth day, it had pretty much learned his normal behavior and everything is green. If there's an unusual traffic slowdown, then it could still become red in the, in the middle there. But by and large, it's kind of learned its, his normal uh, route and his normal behavior. And now we can look at, over time, what sort of anomalies does it detect? So this slide shows two different anomalies. On the left, you can see that um, um, he deviated from his normal uh, commute. Uh, he you know, went on down a side street that he normally doesn't go on, and the system instantly detected that as an anomaly. And we call that a spatial anomaly because it's his actual uh, spatial locations were different from, from normal. The right-hand uh, screen actually shows a, another type of anomaly, which is a temporal anomaly. So there he took a U-turn and went back along the same road that he normally does. It's just that that particular sequence was extremely unusual. He never normally takes a U-turn there. So we were able to instantly detect that as an anomaly. So even though the exact GPS coordinates, the GPS coordinates were identical, the temporal behavior of those coordinates was unusual and we were able to detect that as an anomaly. Um, these two screen, this screen shows a couple of other examples. 
there are some times when he took multiple paths and uh, over time the system can learn both of those as, un as uh, normal. So whether he takes the top, on the left screen, if, whether he takes the top path or the lower path, that's totally fine. However, um, one day he went unusually fast on one of those paths. And so that was an unusual uh, change in speed, and that was automatically detected as an anomaly as well. So this is another kind of uh, temporal anomaly that can be detected. So all in all, uh, we're able to detect really interesting uh, ge geospatial anomalies without making any changes uh, to the algorithm. Just by changing the way we encode our data into an SDR, we're now able to handle different uh, sensor modalities. So one interesting thing here is that all of these applications use the exact same code base. Um, it uses the, they all use the exact same learning algorithm. They actually use the same learning parameters. None of the learning parameters had to be tuned in order to use, um, apply to one algorithm versus the other. And that is key to automation uh, in, in, in these scenarios. And there is very wide applicability across many different types of uh, sensors, as you saw, whether it's uh, data center, monitoring a data center, monitoring social media feed, or geospatial coordinates. As long as we can convert the data into an SDR, into the common data structure, then we can now apply the algorithms to, to that modality. And so it has very wide applicability. Now, is this, is this stuff any good? Does it actually work well? Can we quantify exactly how accurate, accurate it is on, on different uh, data? So this is actually a fairly difficult task. Um, it turns out that when you look at benchmarking streaming anomaly detection, there aren't any existing benchmarks that, re that really work with uh, real data and contain real data and contain the characteristics that we expect, um, that we think are important for streaming analytics. Um, so most of the traditional benchmarks in anomaly detection, uh, they don't incorporate time. So in a streaming analytics, um, application, the earlier you detect the anomaly, the better it is, as you saw in the case where the API server went down. If you can detect it an hour before uh, the failure happens, that's uh, pretty valuable, uh, that rather than detecting, okay, the API server failed. So the earlier you detect an anomaly, the more valuable it is. Most of the benchmarks are pretty batch focused. They allow you to uh, iterate over the data multiple times, whereas in a real-time scenario, you can't look ahead. Uh, you just have the data that you're getting right now and the past data, and you have to uh, make your predictions or detect your anomalies right then and there. And then very few anomaly detection benchmarks actually contain real-world labeled anomalies, particularly time series uh, data. Um, we look pretty hard for that. It's, it's hard to find that. So we, we went ahead and created our own benchmark. Um, because we had worked with a number of customers, we had a bunch of data, and some of that data were allowed to share. So we created a, our own benchmark, which we called the Nementa Anomaly Benchmark, or NAB for short. Um, we implemented a particular scoring methodology that favors early detection. So if you have uh, two uh, algorithms that detect the same anomaly, the one that detected it earlier is going to get a higher score than the one which detected it later. Okay. It incorporates continuous learning, so the notion of uh, changing statistics and then adapting to a new normal uh, baseline. Uh, we have uh, a number of real-world data streams that are labeled, um, some of them by a customer, some of them by ourselves. Um, you can see on the right an example of uh, one of the data streams. This is. Uh, um, data from um, a machine, uh, a large industrial machine, and the data shows the temperature of the machine over time. And you can see that there are three labeled anomalies there. Uh, the one on the left was where the machine actually was brought down from maintenance. The red dot on the extreme right was an actual failure of the machine. Um, and the red dot in the middle was actually where a human, after doing analysis, saw the uh, the first sign of some unusual behavior that then led to the failure later on. Okay, so there's two obvious anomalies on the left and right and one not as uh, obvious anomaly in the, in the middle. In this benchmark, we also have um, uh, the notion of different application profiles. And what that means is that 
um, the ratio of uh, false positives versus uh, false negatives uh, and the importance of a false positive versus uh, uh, a false negative, it kind of changes uh, depending on the application. And you can imagine that, let's say, in a medical scenario, it may be okay to have a few false positives, but you definitely don't want to miss a, a really bad event. But there might be other cases, and the IT is actually one of those that where you don't want to get too many false positives. It's okay to occasionally miss a server that crashes because you know you have lots of servers and the systems are generally robust. So what you really want to avoid is having too many false positives. So we have different application profiles that um, uh, correspond to that. So we've tested uh, the HTM against uh, three different open source algorithms, um, and we were pretty happy with the results actually. Uh, we were not expecting uh, this. Um, so this chart shows um, uh, the scores uh, with HTM against uh, several other algorithms. If you just look at the standard column um, that's on the, on the left there, you can see that the HTM performed quite a bit better than uh, some of the other open source algorithms that are out there. And we, why is this? We, we looked into this a little bit more, and this chart actually shows an example of why the HTM algorithm scored so much better. So overall, the HTM tends to detect uh, more, more anomalies and has fewer false posit positives. But more interestingly, um, it actually detects anomalies a lot earlier than the other algorithms. And the reason for this is that we are looking at, um, the HTM is trying to detect temporal sequences and looking at anomalies and temporal behavior. And so even though the actual value itself may not be out of range, the particular sequence of values may be very unusual. And this uh, chart here shows one example of that. So here's an example of a, of a failure in this machine temperature uh, sensor data that I was showing. Um, all the algorithms detected the anomaly, but the HTM actually detected it much earlier than, uh, than the other algorithms. Okay, so um, just one uh, last slide before I wrap up. Um, we have been, uh, our basic business model is a licensing model. We um, license our technology in, in various different ways. So first of all, we have a, an open source version of our code. Uh, so all of our code, including our learning algorithms and our learning parameters and the HTM engine, everything is available um, uh, and open source under an AGPL license. And this is available on, on GitHub. It's a pretty uh, active uh, GitHub uh, project. We have uh, over 3,000 GitHub followers. Um, there are over 160 people who have contributed code back to it. So it's one of the more popular uh, machine learning projects on, on GitHub. And we have a very active kind of mailing list. So I encourage you to get involved in that if you're a developer and, and want to learn more about this. Um, everything we do is in, the, in open source. We also have uh, a number of different corporate partners. So I've listed uh, some of the interesting ones here. Um, we have a partnership with a startup called Cortical.io, and they're actually trying to apply the HTM algorithms to uh, natural language processing. So you can think of words as being streaming data as well. If you get a sequence of words, and, there are, and you want to be able to do various uh, types of analytics on that. Um, we have a very uh, rich partnership with IBM. So IBM is working very closely with us on core HTM research. Um, they're also uh, working with us to create very novel hardware architectures for HTMs. We know that what we're modeling today is a very tiny slice of the cortex. And in order to really scale up and detect uh, and handle a lot more complex problems, at some point we are going to need uh, hardware, uh, new hardware architecture. So IBM is working closely with us on that. Um, we also have a partnership with uh, Avic Partners. Um, so they, uh, this is a, a new, brand new startup that just started a few weeks ago, and they have licensed the Grok um, application that I showed earlier, and they are going to uh, take over and productize that and put a lot of effort behind that for IT and doing automatic analytics and anomaly detection for the IT uh, scenario. So you can look at grokstreams.com to uh, get more information on that. Okay, to, to, to summarize, I um, hope I've convinced you that the future of data is streaming data. 
Um, the velocity of uh, the sensors that were uh, is increasing rapidly, as well as the number of uh, sensors is increasing. Uh, we're going to have to handle a, a world where we uh, have to create a very large number of models, a massive number of models, and where the data can, uh, you know, where the statistics of the data can change at any point in time. And the problem with today's methodology is that the existing batch algorithms just cannot scale, and there's fundamental limitations in the methodology and the process by which these algorithms are, are created today that just will not apply. Um, we think that the brain does this already automatically, and that understanding the brain and understanding the cortex in particular can show the way. And we, the brain is sort of an existence proof that you can have systems that can automatically create models and learn new things, can continuously learn and can model very sophisticated temporal streams. Uh, we've created um, an initial uh, implementation of this in the form of HTM learning algorithms that implement some of these principles, and then we can demonstrate uh, working applications today. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to uh, take questions um, through the Q&A forum here, and, and feel free to email me at that uh, email address as well. Subhataya Ahmad, thank you so much. Really fascinating uh, work that you're doing. Um, before we dive into the questions, I want to give people a couple minutes to type those in. I uh, just want to let people know, too, if you would like to mark your calendars, the next Smart Data webinar will be on October 8th. Our topic will be Machine Learning Techniques for Analyzing Unstructured Business Data with Nick Pendar of SkyTree. And uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in already. So, Subhatai, uh, in the Twitter analysis for stocks, the example that you showed, is natural language processing used at all? And if so, how is the text converted into an SDR? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so in the application I showed there, uh, which is available today from Google Play, um, natural language processing is not used. What we are doing is monitoring the frequency uh, which a particular stock is mentioned uh, on, in every five minutes. So uh, if someone, you know, if you get 100 mentions of IBM in five minutes, the value of that will be 100. And we're taking that numerical stream and feeding that to the HTM and doing anomaly detection. Cortical I.O., though, is looking at applying natural language processing and HTMs to Twitter streams. And what they're doing is, is really interesting. They're looking at not the number of mentions, but whether the underlying semantics of what's being discussed is changed significantly. So if you look at uh, news uh, media, for example, um, if the meaning of what's being t um, tweeted about at any particular point in time changes significantly, then maybe there's a shift in, in the type of news that's happening right now, and that uh, could be treated as an anomaly. So they're looking at applying natural language processing with HTMs to, to social media, but uh, that's not released as a product yet. Okay. Um, can, can this technology be applied to data quality? I'm assuming the questioner means to monitoring and finding the anomalies that you might in data quality. Yeah, um, so I didn't talk about that here, but uh, some of our customers in the past have used it for that. So one example is uh, if you look at energy and, um, and um, the proliferation of smart meters. Uh, so more and more buildings are being instrumented with smart meters where uh, your energy is being monitored, and every five minutes or every 15 minutes you get your average energy use, which is sent back to some uh, central location. And one of the problems there is that these meters are inherently unreliable, and they, um, there's various kind of data quality issues with that. So you can apply the anomaly detection techniques to that, because some of the characteristics of the data quality problems are actually not easy to detect. Sometimes you know, the, the meter will just um, uh, go offline, and that's easy to detect. But sometimes the values will actually just fluctuate really fast in a completely unnatural way. And so that, that kind of anomaly is a temporal anomaly, and you'd like to be able to detect that uh, automatically. And when you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of smart meters out there, it's pretty impractical to manually uh, be uh, overseeing all that. So having an automated anomaly detection technique is, uh, is pretty useful. Mm. Um, 
picking up on that, the next question addresses anomaly detection. Most of what you discussed was anomaly detection, which of course is a binary result. But your initial example was a model that yielded values. How does HTM tie into predictive analytics uh, yielding values? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, prediction is kind of inherent to what's going on in the cortex all the time. We're constantly making predictions and, and seeing whether our predictions have been met or not. And the HTM algorithms actually inherently do prediction. And for us, anomaly detection is just the flip side of prediction. So if you predicted some, uh, something and it does not happen, instead what happens is very different, then it's an anomaly. Um, we have applied the HTM to uh, lots of different prediction problems. So we've looked at monitoring energy usage. Uh, we've looked at predicting energy usage. We've looked at uh, the revenue forecasting example that I showed earlier. Uh, we've looked at uh, prediction of advertiser click-through rates and so on. Uh, the reason I focus mostly on anomaly detection is actually um, the industry itself does not seem to be really ready yet to incorporate prediction into their business day-to-day -day business process. Um, and this was a very interesting lesson uh, that we learned. If you have real-time predictions, it's great, but people the, or companies don't know how to react to that. So if you suddenly uh, predict that your revenue forecast for um, you know, a particular department is going to uh, go through the roof for the next three hours, how do you react to that? What processes do you need to actually deal with that? Um, and the, sec you know, the other part of it is that a lot of the streaming data infrastructure for uh, the interesting prediction problems weren't actually ready yet. So we haven't actually had much success in actually deploying streaming prediction um, applications yet. We believe the industry will be more ready for that in the uh, in a few years, but today the, the real uptick has been in anomaly detection. You know, places like IT and finance and so on, uh, they want to do anomaly detection and their infrastructure is actually a lot better, in, in much better shape right now. Uh, the next question is, how many layers of neocortical processing does HTM simulate? Okay. Um, so, in, in the cortex, there's levels and there's layers, and those are actually two separate things. There's a hierarchical levels that I mentioned earlier where you have uh, a, a region, you know, one region of the brain sending information to another region of the brain. Um, in, and when you look at the levels of processing uh, and the hierarchical levels in our computer vision systems, we actually had three levels of hierarchy in there. Um, and most recently, the, the analytic stuff we showed actually only has one level um, of hierarchy, and that's been sufficient for the, uh, the, the application that I showed you. There's something else in the cortex, another structure which I didn't really get into, which is the concept of layers. That within a level, the, uh, the cortex has five or six different layers of cells, and it looks like each of the layers is actually um, the, the, the layers are kind of hooked up in this little microcircuit, and each layer is responsible for different functions that are repeated throughout all the levels. So things like sensory motor inference and uh, be generating behavior and uh, attention and so on are all implemented in different layers. And that's an active area of research for us. We've, looked, we've got models of two or three of those layers and we're working on, on, on more of them, but those are not deployed in the HTM engine application that I showed. So, so to summarize, you know, we've done you know, up to three different levels of hierarchical levels in, in HTMs before, and we're working on kind of the layers, the laminar structure of, of the cortex right now as a research effort. Okay. Have you tried applying the solution to problems where events may occur only very rarely, say once every couple of years? And uh, a follow on to that, more generally, are there limits to the data frequency? Yeah, so um, the machine temperature uh, data I showed you, um, I, don't, uh, I didn't really point this out, but that one, uh, the time scale, scale was over, I think, uh, half a year or a year, and there were three anomalies in, in that time frame. So that's an example of kind of the, the level of uh, you know, the most rare 
uh, anomaly that we've, we've worked on. You know, by definition, anomalies are going to be rare events, and our system kind of guarantees that you're not going to get more than, you know, the number of false positives will be very limited, and you're not going to get uh, too many anomalies. Um, in most of the real-time scenarios we deal with, uh, the, the frequency of the data is sort of around every five minutes or every half an hour, every hour or so on. And that's kind of a sweet spot for um, the, the, you know, the algorithms. Um, you know, we've gone as fast as uh, multiple times a second, um, and we've gone as slow as sort of once a day. But slower than that, it gets, you know, even once a day, it's kind of hard to pick up on the repetitive patterns because you'll need several years of data to really uh, see a lot of the patterns. So we're, most of our stuff works really well at the kind of, uh, you know, one data point a minute or one data point a second to about one data point an hour. That's kind of the sweet spot for uh, the cortical algorithms. Mm. Um, can it be applied to real-time recommendation? Um, yes. Um, so we've looked at uh, applying it to, um, you know, websites where um, you can look at a news website, for example, and you look at, uh, if you go to a news website, um, you'll see a bunch of links that, you know, correspond to news articles that you may be interested in. Uh, typically, those are uh, dependent, th those are uh, computed based on overall kind of uh, popularity of articles. Um, what you could do with an HTM is actually fine tune those recommendations based on your particular browsing behavior. So if you happen to, you know, go to the, go to Forbes.com or something and you're interested in looking at, um, you know, the technology section, uh, it, you know, based on your particular behavior, it might automatically figure out that, um, you know, people who read your section might also be interested in some of these other articles. So you can do recommendations that are very tuned to your particular sequence of uh, behavior. And we actually did a project with Forbes.com. It was a proof of concept that showed that if you apply HTMs, you can uh, improve the prediction of which articles a user is going to click on significantly, so it's uh, going from a, about a 20% um, uh, you know, success rate, you can get to about a 50 or 60% success rate of, of mm -hmm. predicting what articles a, a person might be interested in. Again, the issue though is um, data infrastructure and you know, incorporating these things in real time, uh, this, that's where a lot of the challenges are in, in real time recommendation. Sure. Uh, we have a couple questions here about SDRs specifically. So, first is how many variables can fit in an SDR? Yeah. Um, so, in the brain, um, um, SDRs can handle a very large number of independent inputs. And if you think about a vision, for example, um, you know, each pixel is kind of its own independent sensor reading, and it's reading, let's say, a grayscale value or a color value, and you can have an SDR that represents an entire image or, you know, you're processing up an, up an image. Um, what happens in the brain, though, when you have a very large number of variables is that there is a topology there so that um, neurons that are looking at a particular pixel tend to look at neighboring pixels and they incorporate that information. So the SDR that there is sort of localized to that particular part of the image. So that's a, a technique that the, the brain does that, uh, to actually handle a very large number of um, variables into a single kind of SDR representation. And we, we've used that same technique in dealing with um, uh, vision and cortical IO is using that same technique to deal with language where where each S, the SDR is representing the meanings of words and you have you know thousands and thousands of different meanings that words can have and, and by incorporating a topology you can kind of efficiently represent all of those variables. Can any time stamped data be converted into SDR? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, so the general answer is yes, and all of, any time stamp data can be converted into an SDR, but to really exploit the cortical algorithms, you really need to have, uh, you know, time series data and a stream of, of data that's kind of logically related. 
Um, if you have a timestamp but one data point is completely unrelated to the next data point, um, then the, even though you can convert it to an SDR, the cortical algorithms won't really uh, know how to deal with that. And you can think about, as an analogy, imagine you're looking at a, watching a movie. Uh, maybe every frame of the movie can be converted into an SDR, but if you randomly shuffle all the, all the frames, then it's, it's going to be garbage to you. Uh, you really need to see things in a logical flow. So having a logical time series uh, data stream is pretty important for the cortical algorithms. This is actually quite the opposite of traditional machine learning algorithms. The traditional machine learning algorithms don't care about that time order. Um, in fact, all of the techniques assume there is no time order and that uh, the data points are uh, independently distributed. Um, and so uh, those techniques are really good in situations where there is no inherent uh, time series or time order. And the cortical algorithms are really good for data where there is an inherent, sequ you know, where there are inherent sequences and inherent flow to the data. Subhatai Ahmad from Numenta, thank you so much for this uh, great presentation and your thoughtful answers to our questions. Uh, I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Just to remind our listeners, we will be posting the recorded webinar and the slides to dataversity.net within two business days. And I will send out a follow-up email to all of those joining us today to let you know how to access that material. The next Smart Data webinar again will be on Thursday, October 8th. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again for attending today's webinar. And uh, thanks again to our speaker, Subhatai. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, everyone, for the great questions.